Did you see the match commercial? I was going to say that, but I didn't know Come on. if we hey, should Ronnie. say hey, Ronnie. anything about it. Yeah, it's so I good. I saw that, and I was like, you got to be kidding That's me. right. So so Satan is flipping through, can't find a match, can't find a match. All of a sudden, a match pops up, and, and he meets he meets this woman underneath the, oh, there's a seat right here, the bridge, and she goes, Satan? And he looks at her, and he goes, 2020? <laughs> They're just going through like she gets like she ends up going to like a, a a bathroom and steal all the toilet paper. Right. They're like going. They're sitting and like there's these asteroids coming in and, and he's like, I just don't want this to end. I'm like, what is going on? Right now? <laughs> no. Wow. I don't want this to end. <laughs> I don't want this year to end. Yeah. Next year. What what's going on is that actually this world is all the time been perishing anyway. Right. Right. This yes. world hasn't been living. Right? right? We've been lulled into the place where we think it's been living, or we think that there's life in it, but this world that was founded by Adam, this isn't the earth that God founded, this is the world Adam founded, right. when he planted death into the world. Well, I mean, the word death tells you right off the bat that it doesn't have <laughs> eternal life. And so it's passing away. Death is passing away. And the world that was founded upon death, one that's filled with trying to find life by the sweat of our brow and by our own strength and our own ability, that world has ever since been passing away, right? And so we can see signs and wonders that testify that, to that of some time, right? It's not God sending a plague. It's not God sending a hurricane or a tornado or a storm or fires or anything like that. It's that the world that Adam founded has been built upon death. And so you could see different shades of that death manifest from time to time or flare up. Right? You get a flare-up. Right? If you got like arthritis or something, the cold can come and you get a flare-up in your joint. And you're like, oh. Well, it ain't like just all of a sudden the arthritis was there. It's that the arthritis was already there and something flared up. And so the death that's in this world is already there. And there's different times where it's going to flare up. And it's not a sign of God being upset. It's not a sign that God is far. It's not a sign that... Uh, we're now cursed by God or anything like that. What it's a sign of is that man can't produce life in their own strength. And Adam tried to produce life in his own strength. And when he put this arm, the arm of the flesh, to work, to try to build life in this world, what he built was death, right? And that's what it's a sign of. It's a sign that, man, human beings don't have life in themselves. And neither can we produce life in ourselves. There's one who has life in himself. Like Paul would say, God, the only immortal, right? He's the only one who has life in himself. And what we know in light of everything that's happened in, in 2020 is that we need someone to serve us with life, right? That's what all this means. That's it. And it's not like that God sent it to tell us that. It's just the truth, right? We need someone else to serve us with life. And thank God, he wanted to serve us with life more than we wanted to be served with life. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. There's no shadow in turning in this guy. He can't help but be father. He can't help but be the prince that brings us peace. He can't help but be wonderful counselor. He can only ever be himself. Even should we try to make him be someone else or somebody that he's not, he can't deny what's in his heart. Mm -hmm. Right? What's in his heart is to serve us with life. Right? That's what's in his heart. And so 2020 kind of serves as a reminder of that to me. Like there were some people at the beginning of the year, you know, big ministries, they'd come out with their, it's the year, the word for 2020 is hope. The word for, and I think, I, I, I might be mistaken, but I think a bunch of people said the, the 2020 was the year of hope or the word for 2020 was hope. Now, I'm not sure they know what the word hope means. Right. But, <laughs> but to me, it rings true now. Because in, in 2020, yes. it's not that I didn't already know it, but I look around and am even more persuaded now than ever that the only certainty of good and of life is contained in God. That the world cannot <laughs> promise me anything other than death. The only thing the world has to give me is death. And so whatever I thought that I could suck out of the world, whatever I thought I could gather from the world to build myself a life, it become abundantly clear that there's nothing but uncertainty in the world. Right? And so it just... Knowing what I know about God, it just reminded me that there's one sure hope, right? And the word hope in the Bible means to have a certainty. Not like, well, like we say it, well, I hope this happens. Like right now, we all hope 
that the COVID goes away in a short time and we never have to see it again. Well, when we say hope like that, we, we're thinking we don't know if it's going to happen. Right. But we desire for it to happen. Yeah, wish. But you know, Like wish. Right, yeah, we confuse right. biblical hope with wish. But biblical hope is to have a certainty. And we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have an incorruptible hope, Peter would come and say. And that hope is that there's no shadow in turning in God. He gets a buzz in serving us with life. Nothing makes him happier than to serve us with life. And we have a sure hope, an incorruptible hope, a certainty of life, a certainty of good. We have an expectation that the fruit of the Spirit will manifest in us. We have an expectation that life will manifest in us because of what God has done in Christ. Amen. Right? right? And in 2020, that just become more real to me than it ever was. Right? And it's just like every once in a while... The world will reveal itself for what it is. Right? Right? That's it's right. like all the time looking good for food. It's like all the time looking like its wisdom is very wise. And then we start to want to go, oh, well, that tree looks nice. That tree looks like it can give me the peace and the love and the joy that I desire. Let me go over there. It looks like this. There's some wisdom here, too. Until Look. the COVID. It, it, yeah, it looks real smart. Let me start eating that. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, well, bam. Right? And, and it reveals itself to you. And it's kind of like what Jesus did at the cross. It's like the great and powerful Oz. Right? You hear that voice and you see the green smoke and you think it's like this, you know, mighty God, like Zeus or something. And then you pull back the curtain and it's a little bitty guy that's like a, a munchkin. Right? He's like five foot two or something. He's got to have a stool to get up on the chair or whatever. Right? And so the veil gets pulled out the way that it's what Jesus did at the cross. See, we were busy thinking that the life the world could offer us, the strength that was in the world, would be unto a good life. We thought it looked good for food. We thought this will be our food for life. Look at the strength I have in my hand. Look at my intellect. Look how smart I am. I can figure everything out. I can build life in the world. I can preserve my own life. Glory to God. And then Jesus come and said, these guys are blind. Let's show them what they think is good for food. Let's show them that the thing they think can serve them with life. Let's show them what it really looks like. And on the cross, he pulled back the veil, and he said, this is what you're busy with. The thing you think is good for food, the thing you think is wise unto life, this is what it gives you. It uncovers your nakedness, and it leaves you nailed to a tree. Right? And so the COVID, it just pulls back the veil. Right? And again, don't anybody misunderstand me. God doesn't send the COVID to pull back the veil, but the world can only ever give you what it has in itself. And what it has in itself to give all of us is death. Right? Death. And so we can live in this world knowing that our life isn't of this world. And that's how we can actually enjoy life as we walk in this world. Right? And enjoy the things that are there. And then we can have our minds filled with uh, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, which is that God has taken this earth that had death planted in it, and he's reconciled this earth back unto his eternal life in Jesus. And there's coming a day where he's going to, just like in Genesis, where he removed the darkness from the light, or he separated the darkness from the light, there's coming a day where he comes back in the full manifestation of the light of his life, and he's going to separate darkness and death from all of creation. Right. And he's going to cast it into the lake of fire. Right. Right? The first thought we should all have about hell is that God's going to send death to hell. That's actually what it was prepared for. Right? The, the prophecy of the end. If you notice when God, when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God prophesied of the end that would come to the serpent and his system of death. Hell, the idea of eternal destruction was never with the intent for human beings to make themselves partakers of that. It was with the intent that God was prophesying of the end that would come to the serpent and his system of death. Now, unfortunately, some people store up for themselves the same end. They love the darkness more than the light. They, they, they see that God has built a house for them to dwell in when he raised Jesus from the dead, and they're busy thinking... What do I need that house for? Just like they were telling Noah. Why are you building this boat, bro? It ain't even rained yet. What are you talking about? It's going to rain. I don't know if we realize how foolish Noah looked. It hadn't rained yet on the earth. It was just dew coming up from the ground. There was no physical rain yet. Noah's busy telling these guys it's going to rain. Man. The blood's going to come. God, God's going to cleanse this earth from the death that's tormenting us, that's bruising us. But he doesn't want any of us to perish. So I built this ark so we 
could be pitched within and without. So our lives could be pitched within and without. So that when God cleanses the earth from death, we won't perish with the death. And that's, that's the same thing God had to get right with us. God's once again going to cleanse the earth. But it's not going to be by flood. It's going to be by the light of his life. Yes. His life is going to baptize or flood this whole earth. Right? Now when his life baptizes this earth, guess what's going to cease to be in the earth? Death. 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 Well, now he's got a problem because the people he doesn't want to perish are in the earth. So how can I preserve their lives from the end that's coming to death? I know, just as Noah built an ark, I'll build them a body that's built with the light of my life. That's right. And then they'll be preserved, they'll be pitched within and without by the spirit of my life. Right. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's mm -hmm. why you see the flame of fire over the disciples' heads on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them. God gets it right through the gospel to baptize us in the fire of his life. So when he comes and baptizes the earth and consumes the death to the uttermost, we're not consumed with it. The only thing a fire can't consume is another fire. Right. And so God's the father of lights, and we're children of the light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Anyway. <laughs> That's good news right there. <laughs> so we can go to something else. No, that was very good because I was thinking... Yeah. I was thinking, well, I could ask a question today. So what, what is the one thing that stands out as you look back? Not self-examining, but as you look back over the year, what stands out to you in terms of what God has done in your life? And for me, it's, it's exactly what you, eternal life. The gospel is a day-to-day -day thing that reminds me how important eternal life is and that that overcomes all of the crap that's behind us. Mm -hmm. mm. So you just, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You were much more eloquent in that, but to me, that's exactly what it is. It's eternal life. You call it eloquent, I call it rambling. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can hear the Led Zeppelin song yeah. in my ear, ramble on. <laughs> and I'm like, man, am I ever going to shut up? It's <laughs> awesome. No, but yeah, and I love how you said that, what's behind me. Yeah. Mm. Right? He who has the son, she who has the son, has wow. eternal life. And you know what that means? Death is behind you. Right. Right? Now, that can be difficult for us to understand sometimes or to wrap our heads around because we're still in a world where we see it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the fellowship with the gospel, right, is a day-to-day -day fellowship with God. It is not meant to be like the bell rings and you got to go to class. Oh, man, i got to go to class. <laughs> no, it, what's, it's designed to happen is you get so captivated by the life God has in himself and that he's given it to you as a gift that you begin talking with God about it daily. Right. You begin seeing things that remind you of it daily. And your mind becomes filled with the word of eternal life. And what that does is it causes you to find the death that's in the world behind you. Like Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. What happens is, is the word of life will well up in your heart to the degree that it says, get thee behind me, death. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you begin living as if your life is seated above the death in the world. Because it is, actually. Yes. Your life right. is actually seated above the death in the world. And God's all the time trying to get us to look at our lives in the person of Jesus. And we're all the time trying to get him to look at our life in the world. Yes. We're all, look, look, look at this. Look at there. Yes. He's all, yes, I know. Well, look there. Yeah. Look there. Like, what are you doing? Yes, I know. <laughs> right? And we, we, we do doing this back and forth kind of deal with him, right? And he doesn't despise doing the back and forth with us. No. Right? It's like... Sometimes you can have a little child that's like, why, 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 why? And they just ask a million questions and they won't shut up. Mm -hmm. Now listen, we, 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 we have these mortal bodies. And so sometimes we can feel frustrated with that kind of a thing. And will this child ever shut up? And we might eventually snap on them. I don't know why. Stop asking. <laughs> but God, <laughs> God, God is not like a mortal man where he can become impatient. One of the, the, the trappings for our mind is our thoughts dwell in temporal state. And so we can be pressed in upon by a lack of time. And many times that can cause us to be impatient. Well, God's not busy with that constraint. He's outside of time. He's the ancient of days. His thoughts aren't born from a temporal state. So he never grows tired of why, why, why. How? How? He doesn't grow tired of that back and forth. Right. right? I've gone back and forth with God so many times it's obscene. Some of them were pleasant. Some of them were angry. Some of them were accusatory. Not him accusing me, but me accusing him. 
Right? <laughs> and you know what he does? He turns the other cheek. Right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Do, do you know what he does? Greg, I got another coat in the house. You want me to go get it for you, man? <laughs> you don't have to steal anything from the house. You don't have to break in. It's all yours, bro. Right? And yeah. he's, he's kind and he's patient because of that. He never grows tired right. of the interaction. He, he's happy just to be interacting. Right? But I love how you say that. Behind. I've been, I've been reading in the Psalms, you know, and er, almost every one of the Psalms is David asking why. And in the same psalm, God answers them why. And it, but when it all comes down to the end, it was all pointing to Jesus, the reason. Yeah. That's it. Glory to God. And he answered. And he answered. The reason, the answer, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yep. Right? The whole kit and caboodle. As as we might say, right, right, right. We'll explain that in church today. The Christmas story. What's it all about? There's some awesome things in there, and to tie everything in together, you know, that's right. an awesome thing. Right. Glory to God. Anybody else got some yeah, thoughts? I was say, who else? Who else is thought? 2020 coming to an end. <clears throat> I don't think 2021 is going to be any different for me. Yeah, like I'm I, 21, it's going to start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess just. The, the blessing of oh. coming into the truth and learning that our, you know that my life is seated above the death in this world. I mean, not to say that it won't come and press against me because it certainly did at certain points in this in this year. But I just feel so much so much more peace, I guess. That nothing nothing that happens in 2021 is going to affect my life either. Oh, no, I got but it's going to happen. I kind of chuckle when people are like, I can't wait for this year to be over and the new year to start. Well, what, what is going to be any different? Right. Really, really what's going to be any different? Everything. God will be there. I'm ready oh, for it to man. be over. <laughs> I'm just telling you that right now. <laughs> so, yeah, go away. 2021. <laughs> <laughs> she has no confident expectation it's going to be better. Well, we, we always have a confident expectation that life is going to be better. But it doesn't necessarily depend upon the circumstances around us. Right? Once you understand eternal life, what happens is, is when you see tribulation come to you, your mind begins to be filled with the fact that the life you have, the faith you have, is precious. It's been tried. In, in the fire, and it's been shown to possess a quality to it to where it swallows up corruption and death. Right. So what will happen is when you encounter tribulation, the faith that we're busy with, the faith that was manifested in Jesus Christ, what will happen is, is when you see tribulation, your mind will begin to go to, but there's a life in me that will swallow up this tribulation with peace and love and joy. <laughs> and you begin to look to the horizon for the peace and the love and joy to manifest in you instead of thinking of the tribulation. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what the gospel will do. So uh, instead of saying swallow up, you could say it's the prevailing logic. Yeah. You could say it's what drives your thinking as you look at the circumstances as opposed to circumstances driving, you. driving your thinking as yeah. you look at yourself. Right. Mm. That's very good. Yeah. And that was, that's what was at work in Jesus yeah. when he was on the cross. Does anybody else need that repeated besides me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Instead of saying swallow up, we could say it's the prevailing logic. Instead of saying like eternal life swallows up death, which is a word picture, mm -hmm. but for those who might not be uh, familiar with that kind of terminology, you could say it's the prevailing logic. It, would start, it is what controls our thinking as we look at the circumstances, as opposed to the circumstances controlling our thinking as we look at ourselves. Yeah. Wow. That's it. Wow. That's good. And another way of saying that is we live in this world by the knowledge of the Son of God and not the knowledge of good and evil. Right? We're not judging our lives by what we say is good and what we say is evil. We're judging our lives by what we see in Jesus. Right? The life we see in Him. So we live by the knowledge of the Son of God. Prevailing logic. The prevailing logic. That's exactly right. And you could look at that. You have the knowledge of God and you have the knowledge of good and evil. Right? One will produce life in you, peace and love and joy. 
One will put your thoughts to rest even in the midst of a storm. One will put your flesh to rest even in the midst of a storm. One will produce joy in you even in the midst of the storm. The other one will fill you with anxiety and worry and fear and will take your members captive to laboring and toiling trying to produce life itself. Right? Because the knowledge of good and evil is that we all know that death is evil now. And we are all acutely aware of anything that is the fruit of death. I mean, the COVID is the fruit of death, right? I mean, can we all agree that COVID is evil? Yes. Yes. You think it's evil? I know it's evil. And do you know what that tries to do to us? It tries to war on our souls because we know it's not consistent with life. Yep. And now here it is in our sphere, right? And to live by the knowledge of good and evil is for your life to be shaped by your awareness of the death that's around you instead of your life to be shaped by the awareness of the life you have in God. Right, And that's the temptation for all of us. Because the moment we see death in the world, it wants to come uncover our nakedness. Right, And what the gospel come and do is remind you that God has come to clothe you. And that he is with you to clothe you. And so there's no shame in feeling nakedness. There's no shame in hating the death. God also hates the death. God knows what is good is evil. It's not just knowing that death is evil and life is good. It's trying to find life by that knowledge. Yes. So that let's, is let's evil. Say, let's say you have some stock investments and you've been watching stock. You know, Exxon used to be the biggest company in the world in 2013. Now it's not in the top 40. The stock dropped by 40% this year. I don't know Exxon stock. But let's say you judged yourself as to whether you were rich based on how the stock was doing. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't feel too good. You wouldn't feel too rich right now. <laughs> but let's say you, you, you were already persuaded that you were rich, regardless of how the stock was doing. Mm -hmm. then, you were no, then you're no longer affected by the stock price. Yes. So what we need in the coming year, and what we need today, is the perspective of not being controlled by the stock price. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's you walk around knowledge. feeling rich, even though the world says you're poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. And we can all agree <clears> that... While we're in this world, even though we know there's tribulation in this world and that from time to time we go to encounter it, we all wake up every day not wanting to see it anywhere. Right. Hallelujah. We can all drink to that. Yeah. Whether you like to drink wine or grape juice. Or whether you like to drink uh, sparkling water or champagne. Right? <laughs> we can all agree that we prefer not to ever see that tribulation. I tell, listen, I tell God all the time, listen, man, I'm available not to encounter any of this tribulation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm available. You can get it right for me to, you know, <laughs> skate by over here, skate by over there. Glory to God. That's <laughs> really uh, uh, I so you have what was going on with me this last week. You know, we couldn't wait for our kids to come from Utah. Well, Jay and I are used to being home alone, you know, just the two of us. Nice, quiet house, you know, no chaos, just peace. Well, it's not always peaceful because, you know, we get at, at each other every now and then. But So um, okay. Stephanie and Robert come with their four kids uh, for seven days. So much for peace. And, um, and there were about three times during the week where... I literally felt like there was a bomb inside of me that was going to explode. <laughs> and it wasn't a nice feeling. <laughs> and the anxiety was so strong. And so right away I'm thinking, why can't I be more like him? Because chaos and noise doesn't bother him. And it puts me right over the edge like, i got to get out of here. I can't stand this. And, um, and so I'm judging myself. I, I want to be more like him. I don't want to. I don't want to have these feelings steal the life because I want to enjoy my family. But um, you know, I, I can see. I mean, every everything you've said so far this morning was directed in my mind to what I was experiencing because I know that those feelings <clears throat> aren't what bring me life or take away the life. You know, I can I can rise above the feelings, but sometimes you just want that to go away now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to have to live five more minutes feeling like there's this bomb that's going to explode. So um, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, as Sue would say. Hi, Sue. <laughs> you know, to, to be able to be experiencing that terrible feeling and at the same time know that, because the lie that was coming in was that who I am isn't good. 
I don't want to be like this. Now, why can't I be like that? So it's easy for, for those feelings to, you know, get turned around in such a way that you, you, you get, I mean, my mind got all screwed up, you know. Yeah, because when you, like, I, like we were talking about, our conscience is acutely aware, aware of what is born from life and what is born from death. So immediately when you're having these feelings, you don't need to know it intellectually. Your heart says these feelings cannot be born from life because right. Right. they don't feel nice. No. So then those feelings act as an uncoverer of your nakedness. If we want to use biblical yes. language, mm -hmm. Adam's nakedness being mm -hmm. uncovered. Right. And it wants to be a sign to you that you're separated from what you need for life. Right. Right. And it wants to put all those judgments on top of those feelings, which already suck to begin with, yes. right? But what, what really compounds the issue is when those judgments get, get put on to it. Mm. And so what God would want to come and say is he would want to come and sit with you. And he would want to sit with you with the intent to clothe upon your heart, right? And the way he would clothe upon your heart could sound a lot of different ways, but it could sound something like, well, Cindy, is it okay if you feel a little discombobulated at first? Because you have all these people. You have, well, you think it's a lot, but God might think it's a little. Right. And so he might begin the conversation by talking to you about the giant that you think is so giant that he sees is actually very small. And so he might begin talking to you about, is it okay that you feel a bit discombobulated and feel like you're about to lose your mind? Is it okay? I mean, goodness, you were just in this house with just Jay. Everything's orderly and nice. You spend your time situating everything, and look how nice it looks. And how about if she says no to somebody? Okay. I don't like this. <laughs> and she might say that, and then okay. and then the conversation will go based on what she would say. But yeah. that's how the conversation would begin. He would confront with his thoughts about it. Her first thought would be that what it's the end of the world. What's happening inside of me? His thought would be, you know what? It makes sense that you could feel this way, right? And the way that the feeling would go away would be for your heart to judge it or to disesteem it. Right. As this feeling doesn't mean I'm separated from life. Right. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. Right? That's how God would work in our hearts. The feeling becomes gigantic. It begins testifying to us that we're separated from what we need to have a good life. That's why you're saying, if only I could be like Jay. Well, God would come and try and minister to you in a way that would disesteem the feelings in your heart. And the way he would do that would be like, is it really that shocking you could feel this way? Right? He would begin whacking at that thing. And by the end of it, what would happen is you would think, like Paul said, in light of the life I have with God, these feelings is a light affliction. Right? He would come to persuade your heart that these feelings are a light affliction. Right? Because right now your heart is saying these feelings are a gigantic affliction. It feels like I'm going to die. It feels like you're going to die. <laughs> But the feeling that you're going to die comes from the judgment that you're making about yourself and your life because you feel that feeling, right? And so the gospel could come in and disesteem that in your heart. It says Jesus disesteemed the shame of the cross. You think there was an explosion trying to go off inside of him when he was being nailed to that tree? I mean, mm -hmm. think about when they stretched him out and they started nailing the nail into his hand in the tree. You think there was an explosion going on in him telling him this isn't right? Telling him he's separated from life? Yeah. Telling him he wishes that he was like John down there? Yeah. Mm. Right. <laughs> you, think, you think he didn't have those thoughts? But see, what happened is the Holy Spirit interceded in his heart. And it interceded with the conversation. And the conversation that went on in Jesus' heart, by the end of it all, it disesteemed the shame of the cross inside of his heart. Mm -hmm. Where his heart counted the cross as not being able to separate him from life as not being a sign that he didn't have life, as not being a sign that God was separated from him, as not being a sign that he didn't have something he needs to enjoy life. See, those feelings were trying to tell you, well, Cindy, you can't enjoy life now, can you? If you can only get rid of these feelings, then you can enjoy life. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what the stranger would have been saying to Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus, how can you enjoy life nailed to this tree? Yeah. The things you need... For peace and love and joy, the things you need to enjoy life are far from you, Jesus. Right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is the gospel will come and disesteem that voice. It's like uh, Zephaniah says, where Michael comes in, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Eternal life will rebuke the voice of the stranger. Right. 
Right. right? right. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily remove the feelings. Listen, I have the same feelings every time I get up in front of the camera and preach. Every single Sunday. You know what feelings I have? I feel naked. I feel discombobulated. And my brain goes blank. I have the exact same feelings as I had from day one. And I tell you what, day one and through the first two or three years, every Sunday I thought I was going to die. And this was the last Sunday I can do this. And I'm shutting down the church. Some of you guys don't know. You come to church on Sunday and you're literally a couple seconds away from hearing me say, it's over. <laughs> because of the pressing I felt within. Some of these guys know. I mean, I would go and talk to them. I, I'm like, how can I survive? You know? And I feel the same thing now. But you know what's changed is inside of my heart, my heart has decided that these feelings don't mean squat. Right. My heart has judged them in a way that's consistent with eternal life now. Right. And so I don't feel like these feelings are a sign that I'm separated from life or that I can't function or that something bad is happening or that I can't enjoy my life. <clears throat> and so now my heart has disesteemed that whole dynamic. And so I have the same feeling, but the feeling doesn't bring me pain. Right? It's just like an uncomfortableness. You become comfortable feeling uncomfortable because you become so aware of the life you share with God that you feel, you'll laugh at yourself. I laugh at myself now. I mean, how, I've been doing this like 10 years and I still can't get up there with my brain going blank. Before, I would be like, oh my God, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Now I'm like, I still can't remember what I want to say. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> you know? And so you can even begin to, to where you would have the feeling and you could find yourself making fun of it. You know? Instead of feeling so much <clears throat> angst about its presence. Right? Mm. You begin to think, okay, yeah, it makes sense. You know? That you could feel this way. And that it's not inconsistent with whether I have life. And the moment you don't think you're separated from some good thing you need to have life or to enjoy your life is the moment those feelings that were telling you that get shrunk down real small. It's like, whoop! I mean, Goliath looked real big, didn't he? Yes. David didn't even need a sword. How big was he? He didn't even need a shield. How big was he? Mm -hmm. He took out a little rock and took a slingshot and killed the big bad wolf that looked so big and bad. How big and bad did he look when it took a little tiny pebble <laughs> to take him out? But he looked so fierce, he looked so intimidating to all of Israel that they didn't even want to come against the guy. Right? right? right. And then look what took him out. Yeah. How big was he? How big was he really? It's right? And what took him out was a rock. A rock. That's Jesus. And so we have that same kind of thing where we could feel feelings and we know they're not consistent with, with life. And then we start building on that and judging it, and running with it, and feeding it, and feeding it. Next thing you know, it's like Goliath in our heart. But how big is the giant, really? Mm -hmm. What I thought, listen, man, I thought getting up and preaching every Sunday was the biggest giant there ever was. I couldn't, I was dying. And I sat with this contradiction, because on this hand, I desire to preach the gospel. And on this hand, I feel like I'm freaking dying, right? And so what was I going to do? And so that was a giant for me. But I can tell you now that it's like shrunk, God shrunk it down. And all I did was just keep talking with God, right? And talking with godly people. And when I say godly, I don't mean good in the sense that we think of good. I mean people who know God, right? Because like Jesus said, there's none that are good in the sense of they're good because of their good works, right? right? There's just God is good and do you know the one who's good? And anybody who knows the one is good, I want to talk to them about life. Right? If I'm struggling to hear from God or if I'm struggling in whatever dynamic that I'm in, I want to talk to people who know the one who's good. Right? And that's what you do. And you begin engaging in it. Right? It's like we're so ashamed of the nakedness that we feel so much pain over the nakedness. Sure. Well, all of a sudden, man, the gospel will make you unashamed of your nakedness. You'll be like Adam, naked and unashamed. You become more aware of God with you than you are of your nakedness. Right. And that's when the thing that uncovered your nakedness gets shrunk really small. Mm. Right? And so I would encourage you to begin talking with God about those feelings. And it can be a very simple conversation. You can go back and listen to all this because we just dissected it. But you could just begin talking with God about what, what judgment did he make when he felt these things? You see? Because... God also felt what you felt. Right. It's not that you felt that and 
He doesn't feel it, and so how can he be of any help? No, no, no. Mm-hmm. He put on your skin suit, and he felt that explosion that you're talking about. He felt all of it. And so he knows exactly how you feel. And so you could say, my father knows all about this. He's felt these very things. Mm-hmm. And you could start talking with him about, father, how did, how did you walk out this? How did you deal with this? How did you see this? What were your judgments? And then you could find yourself engaging with him about that. And I promise you, that will be unto great liberty in your heart, right? Where he'll disesteem those things as being small, right? right? And he'll give birth to his thoughts about it inside of you, right? And right now, the stranger wants you to get, get you to dwell on the lack you think is present because you feel this. Because he wants that thing to keep growing, right? He's like, let's keep feeding the giant. Let's keep making her think it's insurmountable, Right? And so he wants you to despise yourself for this. Yeah. And he wants you to despise your life on account of it. Because if he can actually get you to live as if this is keeping you from enjoying life, then he's going to be able to take you captive, right, to dealing with it. You'll probably despise yourself for a period of time first. But then when you can't fix it yourself, you know what will happen? You'll end up snapping on the kids and Jay and the grandkids. Because you'll be so upset about it all. And then you'll be even more upset after. And so... That happened too. I'm sure. <laughs> that, that's how it goes down. This is... I'm, I'm not... Just, people are like, oh, this, man, Greg, is Greg reading her mail? No, Greg knows what's common to all humans. And he sees that even when God became a human, these things were common to him. Right? And so you can read everybody's mail when you understand these things. Because we've all lived this. Right? And so you just start talking with God. I mean, I remember... the. This, this pain in me that the first thing God did was make me still in the midst of the pain. I was all the time trying to manage the pain, keep myself from the pain. The first thing he did was he came and captivated me with himself yeah. to where I was still in the pain. Still in the pain, meaning I, I didn't try to deliver myself. Notice I never shut down the church, right? right? right. Because every time I thought, I can't take it anymore, I'm going to die. There he is upholding me. There he is sitting with me, putting me to rest, Right? I'll cover you, Greg. You don't have to cover yourself, right? And I didn't try to cover myself. And you know what happened? He plucked out or he caused my heart to disesteem the uncomfortableness that I feel. It's still there. But I don't care. And I feel happy. It seems like well, one of the judgments <clears throat> Jesus made, which we can make, is that this will pass. Because he said that his father wasn't going to leave him in the grave. Mm-hmm. So I think that was part of his mentality. Uh, if you've ever had a broken bone or a broken heart or uh, you know, pick your, your malady, if you had it more than once, you can look back at the first time and say, I went through the first time it passed. Like I, I've had kidney stones. The first time I had a kidney stone, I thought I was freaking dying. I mean, that was like an alien grabbing one of my organs. I mean, it was horrible. The next time I had it, I was thinking, well, this is going to pass. Right. I mean, literally. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping that it was going to pass. <laughs> but, so Jesus wasn't looking at the circumstances saying, well, these are permanent circumstances. These are everlasting circumstances. These are eternal circumstances. He was looking at it as, this is going to pass. 2020, it's about to pass. It's about to be behind us. Uh, what's not going to pass is... Uh, our life with Christ. Right. That's the one thing we can look at and say, that shall not pass. All, all these other things. So, I don't know if that encourages you not, but not only is the visit going to pass, but the feelings that arise in the context of the visit, those are going to pass. And you're actually going to be free of those one day, completely. Yeah. Yeah. You have a confident expectation or a certainty that the life you share with God is going to overcome that for you. Amen. Right? Yeah. And what Thomas says is it's true. And the eternal life will cause you to see what he just described. You won't look at the tribulation and think how big it is and how strong it is. You'll see it and you'll think it's passing away. It's dying. COVID is not living. It's actively dying. Right? The pain I felt at preaching, it wasn't living. It was actively dying. Right? Actually, COVID is dead. It's not alive. That's right. It's, it's COVID, the, well, the disease. The coronavirus is a dead thing. It's not alive. It's actually, det- it deteriorates, and we call that death, but it's already dead. Yeah. As a scientific fact, from when you hear on the news, 
it's, it's not a living thing, it's a dead thing that causes these symptoms in the human being. And so when it goes it's away, it, it actually disintegrates. So it doesn't have life in it in the first place. Right. It's actually already dead. Right. It's actively disintegrating. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so Jesus encountered that numerous times, you know, with multitudes, right? And then he would go and, I mean, he would be with them, and you can't imagine it was always easy. Um, and in one instance is in Mark 3, 9, um, and it says that, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him. And um, he said when they heard how many things he was doing, they came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. So just tell Jay to keep a small boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's the grandkids crush you. Yeah. You have that water right there in the back. <laughs> Push her that is so cute. I'll bring my pedal boat over and put it over. <laughs> no, but I know exactly how you feel, not just from like an orderly perspective, but when I was uh, conceived in like eight or nine months uh, into the process, my mom broke her ribs and they put this stretch band that pressed on her stomach. So I was born claustrophobic. And so it used to be when I got in the small spaces, with too many people, man, I could feel like anxiety when I was wrestling with my brothers. They put a sheet over my head or a blanket, and I would be filled with like this superhuman strength and just toss people. So I get in a room with too many people. Forget about it. I also like things orderly and symmetrical. I also feel there's too many people in this room. You know what I'm saying? And so I can understand it. That's why you have a small church. <laughs> yeah. It's by design. But I could say what what'll happen is. The eternal, like I, I would, I, I would feel stressed out being in this room, right? Like I'd be thinking, like, you know, I'd be looking around. How can I get out? How are they gonna get? I start feeling stressed out for you guys over there. You know, like you trapped back there. You know what I'm saying? But I can honestly say that, and I didn't do anything to get rid of it. I didn't even pray to God for it to be gone. I, I, all I want to say is that in walking with God in the cool of the day, just talking about eternal life, eternal life will just bring peace to every area. Mm -hmm. And our struggle sometimes is to be more aware of the eternal life than we are of the perceived struggle. That, that's the difficulty for us. We become so aware of the struggle or the thing we say we don't like, and we don't see the eternal life as well. Right? Mm -hmm. To circle back to how you started, the thing you be, were the most impressed upon in 2020 right. was the importance of eternal life. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. short, the grandkids go home. <laughs> uh, but maybe they're there to change you. <laughs> well, maybe I don't need to be changed. <laughs> that's the thing. See, that, that was the whole... Well, that's not the whole thing. I mean, there was two things going on. Yeah. The physical part. The physical part is so... I mean, I, when you feel like you're going to explode, it's a very physical feeling like... I can't go. I can't leave my bedroom and go back out into the living room if this feeling doesn't go away, because mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm dying, you know. But then the second part is this isn't okay to mm -hmm. feel this way. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's two aspects. Mm -hmm. But what you said helped me, Greg, because one of the things you said helped me because um, you said you still get up there every week to preach and you still have that uncomfortable feeling, but that uncomfortable feeling isn't overwhelming anymore you don't see it as a bad thing i don't see you, that they can kill me you just esteem that uncomfortable feeling <laughs> yeah. but i was feeling i can't leave my bedroom if this feeling doesn't go away i can't i, I can't go on with this feeling that's how i felt but you're saying i can go on even if that feeling doesn't go away because I, I can disesteem the feeling i'm saying god will disesteem it inside of you right that's what i mean right you're not condemned to want right. to be with people and then not to be able to. Like Paul said, I see the good, I want to enjoy the good, but I find that I'm not able to. Right. And he said, who's going to save me? Right. Oh, wretched man that I am. I want to be out there with the people. I want to preach, but I find this thing inside of me where I can't. Who's going to save me? I thank God for Jesus and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I think what Heather would want to say, not that they're there to change you, but that there's something that God could kick over that would allow you to enjoy your life more. Yeah. And I think what you, it's not that you need to change, it's that if there's something keeping you from enjoying your life, and that you, there's something you want to enjoy, but that you find that there's something else as a stumbling block, 
God is with you to kick that out of the way. Yeah, truth can be born out of right. And there, yeah. and for me, the there, right. And for me, that dynamic is exactly what happened. And I preached about it. I called it giving up the ghost. Right. I, at a very young age, I was said told I was too much for people, and so I didn't ever want to say anything around anybody, and I just wanted to be quiet. And I'm just like the follower, just want to be quiet in all the groups of people because I felt great pain mm. at talking in the middle of people, lest I'm going to cause them pain, lest I'm going to make them uncomfortable, lest I'm going to offend them. I'd rather just shut down and shut up. And so all that came to the surface in the preaching, mm. right? And so what happened was, is through me, <clears throat> knowing enough about the gospel that God put me to rest in the midst of that pain, and he began disesteeming the pain I felt in my heart, what happened was, is I gave up the ghost, or I gave up the Greg that was so scared to offend people. I gave up the Greg that felt anxiety at the thought of what, how people are perceiving him, or what do they think about what he's saying, right? I died to that Greg. I became dead to it. And so there could be something, all of us have encountered things in our lives, and we don't need to try to figure it out and find what it is. No, 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 we just need to know God. We don't need to know what it is. Right. God knows everything. We just need to know God. Right. And through the course of being with God, should there be anything in our lives that can try to work against us, enjoying ourselves, enjoying things that we want to enjoy, God is with us as everlasting Father, as wonderful Counselor. He will counsel us into the place where we experience Him giving us life, right? And we'll be so aware of Him with us that He's in our heart doing these things for us, right? And ultimately, you'll be set free from whatever it is that was the root or the root, whichever way you like it, that was causing the pain to begin with. Right? right? It's just like New Year's resolutions. Like the world will literally come to you every year and say, let's examine ourselves and see what we don't like about ourselves. And, and what are we going to do this year to fix it? You know, and they've actually like concealed it as like a good thing. You know, so people are walking around like, yeah, what am I going to accomplish this year? What am I going to change about myself? And God's just like, look at me. And anything that shouldn't be there, I will pluck out myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think in a way it can be an okay thing. It, all it is, the heart of it is, or it's a picture of just this idea of we can put this all behind us, you know, and that's not a bad thing, but you can make it a bad thing. And I think God has something in him that puts the past behind him and moves on to something new. Yeah. And um, it, that resonates with human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that's just an and to what you're saying. Sure. I agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I just found something really interesting that I didn't realize that I was doing until you were talking about talking with God about how how you're feeling and how he felt when he encountered the same things that we are encountering versus I was always asking why I'm feeling this way and I didn't even realize the condemnation that was bringing in my heart asking God why 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 because I, I like Cindy, I felt like something, why, you know, why is this happening? I felt like something was wrong. So that really just blessed me to hear. I don't have to ask why. I just, ha you know, how did you deal with this? Like, there is something that's wrong. There's <laughs> death in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't that we were never made to be mortal. And so whether we realize it on a conscious level or we pick out little things that are part of mortality that we don't like, that's the problem we have. But then we despise ourselves for not liking it, right? right? Or, we think, or we think we're the only ones. Right, or we think we're the right. only ones. Why what, made, right. why what's wrong with us? That well, God's like, listen, the way that I will be a light unto them in the midst of their darkness is that I will put on their skin suit that is perishable. That's why I said Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. His flesh wasn't sinful because he was without sin, but he put on a body that was subject to mortality, that was able to perish. So that in his body perishing, his heart could feel the exact same things our heart feels. Right. So that he could know, like really know. So that he could be intimately and deeply acquainted with every thought of fear, uh, insecurity, pain that we could ever encounter. And so that we could then identify with him. And begin talking with him from the perspective of, he knows. Because we don't want to talk to somebody who don't know. Mm. Imagine I come and tell Lisa about how, listen, you know, if she was when, when she was pregnant with children, don't be stressed out about having the kids. It's not going to hurt at all. Lisa's going to look at me and be like, 
Don't freaking tell me. How the hell do you know? Right? Because I can't conceive any kids. And so she ain't trying to hear nothing I could say. But if she could look her mother in the face, and her mother has given birth to children, and she can know her mother is intimately acquainted with what I'm going to go through, her mother could be a strong counsel to her. Where God's the same way. She told me not to do it. You did give me counsel, huh? And yet you did it over repetitively, huh? Four times. Yeah, four times. God bless you. <laughs> and they're all beautiful. Do it. <laughs> but it's like God, we, we despise ourselves. That's the first thing. We despise ourselves for even feeling the pressing in. Right. Yeah. That's where we get sidetracked from God to begin with. God, the difference between us and Jesus. I, remember, I love it when Thomas stood up one day. That means we're just the same as Jesus. And for people that aren't in our church, you're like, what's he talking about? Yeah, that's right. He's blaspheming. <laughs> the only difference between us right. and God, us and Jesus, is what we thought about the uncomfortableness that we were feeling. Mm. The judgment we made. Judgment. I promise you, he also judged the uncomfortableness sucked. But then the conclusions he made about it didn't go. separate him from life right. or separate him from all that was good. Right. It caused him to see that all that was good and all that was life was present there with him. And that that life was in him. And that life was going to overcome this. Hallelujah. He began thinking of, I'm a champion, not I'm losing. He began thinking of winning. Winning. Becky likes to say, yay, winning. You know, we all want to like win. Winning. We all want to just ring the bell. Winning, winning. Right? And so Jesus began to think about the life that he shared with the Father in the midst of the uncomfortableness he felt. And he began thinking of, nothing can separate me from that life. And just as much as I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and we're in one another, we're one. Nothing can separate me from the Father. Well, I see in the beginning that the Father and I found the earth, or we had an earth that was filled with darkness and nothingness. And we brought forth light out of nothingness. And we even consumed the nothingness and the chaos with order, all by the power of the life that we share together. Oh my goodness, that life's in me. Hallelujah. That life is going to take this mortal body that's gotten crooked, that's full of chaos and darkness. It's going to take that mortal body. It's going to make it straight. It's it's going to baptize it in light and life. It's going to remove darkness and death and chaos from it. It's going to bring forth the order that was always meant to be. Father! Mm. Right? And so I'm putting words to something that can go on in our hearts without us ever hearing those words. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So don't try to hear my words and think, okay, i got to go back and remember what Greg said so I can tell myself that the next time I'm in pain. No, no, no. I'm speaking about what the Spirit will do inside of you. That's what, we're just putting language to it so that you can feel like, your God is with me. Hallelujah. It's just to remind you of what's in you, right? Mm -hmm. And what it does. Can you cut and clip that, just that last three minutes out? Maybe. <laughs> Probably I he can. He just said, don't try to memorize yeah, it. That's right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, don't listen things. to it 18 <laughs> times. <laughs> don't be as the hypocrites who think they're much speaking. <laughs> He's describing something that's actually already going on without your effort right now. That's yeah. right. You don't need it. Yeah. It's already there. Yeah. It's just so good to hear. Over and over. Right? And that, that's, the, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Woe is us if it's dependent upon our intellect. Oh, amen. If you guys think that, you, if you guys hear me explain these things and you think you've got to get it right to try to intellectually comprehend all that all of the time in order to have peace, you're missing it. Right? You're misunderstanding the dynamic. If we could have salvation through our intellectual reasoning and, our, and our, just our intellect being put to work, we wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. Right. Who do you think it is that is living in us? It's God himself. Do right. you know why God himself decided he needed to come and live in us? Because that's the only way life could come forth, is if he does it for us. But so, what if we were all stopped up with a cold or something, and, and, and we came in and there was a essential oil little gizmo filling the air with something that was going to help us breathe. Now, Greg could explain what was happening as that was in our lungs and blah, 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 and it was a great explanation. We don't need to memorize the explanation of what happened. We just have to be exposed to essential oil. Right. Yeah. Which is what's happening. Right now. Yeah. 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 And that's what the gospel is. It's the Amen. speaking of the spirit of the living God. There's a reason why it's called the spirit of the living God. The spirit of the living God. Right? And it's a speaking forth of that spirit. And should you have believed on Jesus, that spirit we're speaking forth is actively in you. Right? right? And it's connecting with the spirit that, that is in you that already knows all things. The spirit knows all things. Where do you? I didn't learn any of this from a human being. <laughs> I didn't go sit in a class and they told me all this and I got it right to remember it all. I just hung out with God. And you find that God already knows all things and God's inside of you. So he can animate your understanding. 
right? So that you can give words to it. But the, all, the only good the words are is to persuade you that God is with you. Yeah. Right? And he is Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father. Right? And the life he has in himself that you and him share together, that you're in him and he's in you and you're one, that that life is the great equalizer. It makes everything straight. Though the sin that came into the world was causing death to reign over us, man, the light and life that we share with him will make that death as white as snow. It will superabound. As Isaiah says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Who's the comforter? The Holy Spirit. And how does he say that we'll feel comforted? Tell them that their warfare has been accomplished. Tell them that where sin was causing death to abound over them, I have much more abounded over that sin with my grace by the power of my eternal life. I have come and warred a war against the death that was warring against them because I took their death into myself and I consumed it to the uttermost with my life. Now tell them of what I've done to bully the death that was bullying them. Tell them of what I've done to conquer the death that torments them. Tell them what I've done to reconcile their life back to me and the earth back to me. And they'll feel comforted in the midst of their affliction. That's describing what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. That's why Paul come and said that the Holy Spirit maketh intercession in our hearts with groanings that aren't uttered out loud. So who do you think is in there doing the, pr- the praying and the interceding? Is it you? Do I got to listen, Holy Spirit? Get, get, just, yeah. you're, you're blowing it, man. I don't know. I'm, well, you might be fired. It says the Holy Spirit intercedes right. in our hearts with groanings that aren't uttered out loud. For we know not how we should pray. There's another verse that says that. Yeah. And so the Holy Spirit, God's like, no, no, no. We're not even going to leave it up to them to intercede for themselves. <laughs> we're going to get us in them, and then we're going to intercede inside of them towards us. <laughs> And then they're just going to be like part of the huddle. They're not going to be the play callers. They just get to hear the play. And as they become more uh, exposed to the play and the knowing of the play, man, they'll f- experience the benefit of it. But the Holy Spirit is already doing in you what needs to be done. Right. That's what, he, he, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Right? Amen. Amen. I can breathe easier. You can just thank God for, I, listen, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I remember the, when I was stressed out the most about the preaching, I remember I spent like a year where all my prayers to God were, where's the unbelief? I gotta, I gotta get it out, you know? And then, I, literally, I spent a year talking with God about my pain. And he didn't despise me, but then one day I heard loud and clear, hey, Greg, have you considered the resurrection? Have I considered the resurrection? What the hell are you talking about, man? Don't you see this pain? Next thing I know, all my prayers started being around God and what it means that he conquered death. Yeah. Next thing I know, the pain that I thought was so painful became disesteem, where now I make fun of myself, mm-hmm. right? And I laugh at myself, and I forget. And I watch the videos now, and I laugh at myself. Whereas before, I watched a video, and I'd be like, look away, I'm hideous. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like Kramer when he started smoking and having like the smoking room in his, in his apartment, and he, he looks like the Marlboro Man, and he sees himself in the mirror, and he look away, I'm hideous. I'm serious, man. You think I'm joking? I'd go home and turn on the video thinking I want to watch it, even when I thought it was good, and I'd see myself, and I'd be like, <laughs> oh, my God. And now I watch myself and I laugh to the degree that I want to get like a software where I can make funny little gifts out of me. Because I'm all the time doing stuff like this. And, uh, and those things would be very funny. If I could like cut them out and make funny little gifts and me, man, that, that stuff would be gold. Yeah. It'd be hilarious, you know? <laughs> I never could have done that before. And it's not that sometimes I still don't, I still have moments sometimes where I think, man, I blew that. But it, 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 it comes and it goes. Right. Like the sting is healed, right? right? Yep. There's sometimes where I really want to get something across, and I think, oh, I blew it. And I'll be like, good going, Greg. What the heck? Mm-hmm. Right? And then I'm like, ah, oh, who cares? Glory to God. And I tell God, woe is you if your ability to serve people with what I was trying to say is dependent on me saying it right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I get reminded real quick. What? Because, no, we think it's dependent upon us That's so right. much, right? Yes. Yeah, we do. Exactly. That, that, listen, I, I, I've always taken everything seriously. If there was something to be done in life, it was worthy of doing it with intent. And so I never did anything like, oh, I think we'll do that. No, it was like, we're going to do that, and we're going to do it perfect, or we're going to die. And so I have this thing in me where I, I want to preach perfectly. 
And I want to say everything perfectly. I want to get out what's in my heart. And I want it to come out the way I see it in my heart. And I, 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 I wanted that so bad that it got twisted up to where I thought God's power to serve people with life was found in how I talk. Now how silly is that? Right? And so God's ability to set us free and to bring forth life is not dependent upon us. Right? It's not dependent upon us. It's dependent on God. Right. Amen. So Amen. let that be a reminder if we ever go on a mission trip. <laughs> that when you go to talk to someone about Jesus or the gospel of grace or something that you think is beyond your ability to talk about it, if you just speak from your heart, the, the grace will go from you to them. <laughs> it, it will. Even if you, even if you said two, two, plus, 2 plus 2 is 5, when you know that's not right, it'll still somehow go to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Glory to God. All right, guys. I got to get in there.